Welcome to Renewal Cast. Today on the podcast, we're going to discuss chapter 14 of the London Baptist Confession. We're going to talk about saving faith. So join Jay, John, and I as we embark on this conversation. Enjoy it. Well, all right, guys, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start. Get into the London Baptist Confession. We're in uh, chapter 14 of saving faith, and we need to we need to read that. So, who's gonna who's gonna read it today? Jay, you wanna? The grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls, is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts, and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened. Me well, neither. <laughs> right? Yeah. Sorry, I, I was uh, good chance he's wrong. As, as you was, as you as you were reading that, uh, I was. You know, it starts off the the grace of faith, and he made the comment something about that's the only thing we bring to the table. Uh, that was that was the essence. You know, kind of a you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of graces, but faith is what you bring to the table. So that's our uh, our our doing, huh? That's so I was gonna, saying. yeah, it would have been it would have been a lot better yeah. conversation if I would have had the quote. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I would say when somebody says that's our doing. I would say, let's read Ephesians 2 8. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So we don't even bring that to the table. As much as we'd like to believe we we do bring things to the table. It's pretty cl- pretty clear, also, pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then also Philippians 129 says it's not only been granted to you to suffer, but also to believe in his name. I might have those two phrases backwards, but uh, it's been granted to you to believe Philippians one twenty nine. So, yeah, it's, it's humbling, but it's true that faith is a gift to God. We can't even do that. We're so depraved. We're so depraved that we can't, we can't even um, believe on our own and thus save our, ourselves. I mean, it, you know, all you, all you have to do is, 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 is all you have to do is believe and, and trust. And I mean, we're so, we're so bent. We can't even, we can't even bring that to the table. Can't even trust Christ without uh, the, the work of God in, in our lives. God's, God's grace enabling us to do that. You're right. That is, that is humbling. Why do you think, this may be going off in left field a little bit, uh, but we've used the word humble a couple times. These these doctrines, uh, what we're talking about here, the and, and even a broader scope, the doctrines of grace should should bring humility, like we're talking about here. But oftentimes, you you hear the charge of people that that believe those those doctrines like that is is being more more arrogant. Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you think there's? Why do you think that's kind of the stereotype of a of somebody who's more reformed or Calvinistic leaning? I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just because you have, just because you uh, believe rightly about the Bible, doesn't mean you're you're not prone to be proud about it. Yeah, yeah. I I would say that I would say the same thing. We're we're prone to pride in in every area of life. Why not that? Um, so really, I, I think that's actually a, a fascinating thing is what should bring humility and cause us to get on our knees and in, in repentance and just and, and thank God for his, his mercy toward us. And we didn't deserve it actually, actually brings your pride in our, in our life. We're, we're so, we're so sinful that, that even, even that is a, is an occasion of pride in, in many people. And if, so I mean, if we're honest, I mean, I would say even even us, not just some other people, but I think there's areas in our own in our own lives where we've been a little proud in areas we shouldn't have been. In, but. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, my thanks, pride. Thanks for the <laughs> pride. Yeah. Uh, I blew it. I blew it. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. And so then the confession goes on. I, I like that. It's ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word. And so faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ, uh, Romans ten seventeen. Uh, he brought us forth by the word of truth. And so the word working with the spirit, faith is worked in us. So ordinarily wrought by the word. Uh, in in what in what cases did does the, does the word not how is how is faith brought by wrought by anything other than the word? Maybe we should defer that to uh, the next chapter. <laughs> Related um, repentance and salvation. Some of the f- phrasing. And the Long Baptist Confession is quite different in that chapter than the Westminster. And they're wrestling with what do you do with infants? And so if if they die before they hear the preaching of the word, you know, we looked at that part already in the confession. Sure. They believe, but what about repentance? Do they have to repent? And how does that work? And so there's ordinarily by the word, but there would be one exception where if you believe infants, all infants are saved, or maybe they didn't hear the preaching of the word, or maybe they don't repent and they're still saved. Okay. And a biblical example of that, John the Baptist in the womb. It's possible he could have heard the word. Somebody could have read something to him. I mean, it's possible, but but I think that it could be an example you might use. Sure. Okay. Very unusual. Right. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of get that in in the minds of people, you know, the most, most of the time, this is how God, God works. The, the spirit works, right? He uses the, the word of God in our life to bring about regeneration, faith and, and repentance comes through uh, hearing, hearing the, the word. But for instance, um, somebody, an infant or somebody who is, um, incapable there, there may, there may be other instances where God shows grace. After all, he is, he is God. Right. And in those examples, the spirit isn't working contrary to the word. Right. Good point. And then I like how the confession goes on to say, and that's the same way. Basically our faith is increased and strengthened is by the word through the ordinances sacraments, uh, whatever word you want to use there, but through the ministry of the word, that's how your faith has grown. Yep. Church is important. <laughs> yeah. The preaching of the word is important. Personal Bible reading is important. I, I think we need to, and we've talked about this before, I believe, but since we're, since we're just specifically talking about faith, I think we need to go back and just talk about the the object of that faith. So what, what is, what is faith? Let's, let's kind of give it a, a definition when it says that the grace of, of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls. What do we, what is faith? What do we mean by? Well, faith has an object and the object is Christ as revealed in the word. So faith, faith is in God's revealed word about Christ for our salvation and faith receives all that word about Christ. And and there are elements of faith. Historically, the church has talked about different elements. There's knowledge to first before one can really trust something. The man must know some things. You must know about your sin. You must know about Christ. And uh, then you must actually believe that it's true. So then you have, uh, so you have knowledge. You got to know some things. You got to, you got to know about Christ. You got to know about your sin, your need. Uh, Then you need to believe that it's actually true, that the the redemption story is true, that it actually happened. Then in the third element, which is the element that that, uh, crosses the line into being the Lord's disciple would be trust and commitment. You need to entrust yourself to Christ, commit yourself to him. 
trust in him alone to save you. Yeah, there's Around there's a works. there's a difference between believing that a, a parachute has the ability to save you, knowing that it can, um, and actually jumping out of a plane with a parachute and relying on it to to save you. And I think that's kind of the the last that third element that you were talking about there. Yeah. Um, so faith is when we're talking about faith, we're not talking about just buying into something without, without any evidence. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, a belief in, in reliance that we're, we're taking God at his word that what he said is, is true. Um, I think Wayne, Wayne Groom defined faith as trust or dependence on God based on the fact that we take him at his word and believe what he has said. Which I think is getting us into chapter two. Paragraph two. Yeah, yeah, sorry, paragraph two. By this faith, a Christian believes to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself, and also apprehends an excellency therein above all other writings and all things in the world, as it bears forth the glory of God in his attributes, the excellency of Christ in his nature and offices, and the power of the fullness of the Holy Spirit in his workings and operations. And so is enabled to cast his soul upon the truth consequently believed and also acts differently upon that, which each particular passage thereof contains yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith have immediate relation to Christ, accepting, receiving and resting upon him alone for justification, sanctification and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. So by this this faith, this faith that in Christ that, that saves us, the Christian believes to be true whatever is revealed in God's word for the authority of God himself. Yeah, so faith, uh, it, it, you know, sometimes... Uh, I think we need to be careful here. I think there's a distinction we see. Faith, when it comes to the, the principal act, is it, it, there's no uh, there's no faithfulness in the beginnings. There's no obedience in the beginnings. It's it's a trust. It's a resting. It's a receiving. But also, it's a receiving and resting and trusting and accepting all that who Christ is and all his offices. So we we uh, trust him as our savior, as our Lord. We trust him as our prophet to give us God's words. We believe them all. He's our prophet. We trust him as our our priest who takes care of uh, our sins through his sacrifice, through his intercession. We trust him as a king to to save us from the dominion of sin and, and rule us. So we trust him in all his person and offices. And then it, it goes on a to say saving faith does yield obedience to the commands, trembling at his threatenings and embracing the promises of God in this life and which to come. So I think it's, I think it's wise sometimes to separate the principal act of faith from the ongoing faith of a saved person. You guys see, think that's true or, yeah, kind of going along with that. Do, do you sometimes think, uh, sometimes when we read scripture or we're talking about things in a Bible study and we come across the word faith in the Bible, that we automatically just think faithfulness and kind of confuse those two things? Uh, I find that, I was trying to think of an example, uh, but that, that that principle act of placing your, your faith and, and trust in, in Christ is not faithfulness. You don't you don't have the the faithfulness in order to to come to Christ. You you come in and you rest on Him because you are faithless. You you need you need that. But faithfulness, need his faithfulness. But right, you need His faithfulness. But then our faithfulness is a is a product of that, a fruit of that, right? So true saving faith in Christ, that rest in Christ, the receiving of Christ, the those things. Um, that's not, I mean, 
the the faithfulness is in there. It will come. You can't have one without the other. Yeah, faith faith will produce obedience. Paul called it the obedience of faith, Romans 1, Romans 16. Faith will produce, yield to uh, the commands of Scripture. It will tremble at the threatenings. Faith will embrace the promises. But I, I just think it's uh, wise to distinguish when we're talking about the faith that justifies, it's a faith alone apart from works. And yet we know that if it's saving faith, if a person really has saving faith, they will have works. Right? Yeah. And I think the, the reason there is in the, the first part of the, the paragraph, you know, by this faith, this, this faith that God gives us, the Christian believes whatever is to be true, whatever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself. I mean, this is a, this is a, a grace of God that we are to believe that what he says in, in scripture is true and that God is our authority. And, you know, we, we trust in him that what he says is right. So when he says, you know, abstain from sexual morality, uh, then we do it because we believe that what God said is, is true, that he is our authority. And you can't do that without, without faith, without trusting in, in, in Christ and what God says is true. And that is a gift of God. There's a difference there, but then just, just morality, I think. Yeah. And I think if you don't distinguish what we've been talking about, uh, you run into maybe possibly neonomianism or federal vision errors. Uh, what do you think, Jay? We can't separate them. I mean, they go together. Right. Right. Yeah. But we need to distinguish. Yes. Our faith. You start saying like, you know, the federal faithfulness, you need faithfulness to get to heaven. Well, no, now we're getting into some problems. Yeah. Yeah. It depends. And that's where a lot of these guys need, they need to explain. Are you, are you talking about just for justification? <laughs> then, then there's a big problem. Are we talking about, you know, you're just reiterating what, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews twelve fourteen that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Are you talking about that? What are you talking about here? And the need to be precise and, and, and separate things and clarify is just so important. I think what the, the confession is saying here, that it's, it's this true faith in Christ, this gift of God that allows uh, us to to apprehend what he says is true, and therefore, since we we believe that what he says is true, we believe that God is our authority. Then we want to obey him out of faith. I think I think Federal Vision gets the the cart before the horse, if I understand it correctly. Not a not an expert in Federal Vision. Yeah. When we get to the chapter on good works, it'll say they're they're fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith, not that they earn us our ultimate salvation. I also think this does speak to the, uh, we, we might talk about an, an error. I don't know if it's been common in your guys' circles, but in, I've seen it. Is this idea you can take Jesus as your savior and not as your Lord. And clearly the confession, if you're going to be confessional, you wouldn't be able to hold that view because we, we trust in Christ and all, all that's been revealed about him. And he's a Lord. He's a King. And you've got to trust him as your king just as much as you're going to trust him as your savior. You can't like divide him, take half of Jesus. Yeah. I would say when it says for the authority of God himself, I think that, you know, that, that phrase is is speaking of the Lordship of, of Christ. God is King. Yeah, I think Waldron says in his commentary at the end of the chapter, all, all true faith is repentant. All true repentance is believing. That was really good. I, I read that as well. It was a good chapter. He's got to work out. Apparently his doctoral dissertation was on dealing with federal vision and neonomianism and stuff. As it relates to faith. I, I'm interested in maybe getting that work, but that was a really good chapter. He emphasized uh, commitment. He really used the word commitment a lot in that chapter, which is a word we don't often use. I, I'm just saying. Um, which is very important, you know, and 
Um, also, that yeah, stuck out to me was the idea that if you're a believing person, you're a repenting person. If you're a repenting person, you're a believing person. They're, they're, they go together. To be saved, you have to repent and believe. Right. We're gonna get. We're gonna go far here today. Are we going to the third paragraph already. You ready, Cole? <clears throat> we can cover a whole chapter in one week. This faith, although it be in different stages and may be weak or strong, yet it is in the least degree of it different in the kind or nature of it, as is all other saving grace from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. And therefore, though it may be many times assailed and weakened, yet it gets the victory growing up in many to the attainment of a full assurance through Christ, who is both the author and finisher of our faith. I like the verse in Second Peter 1. You have received a faith. The equal standing is ours. This is the apostle saying this. And yeah, Second Peter 1. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Jesus Christ. So even though you may not have as strong a faith as the apostle does, the weakest person in that that letter was written to to all Christians has the same standing, equal standing, even though their faith may be weaker. Uh, that's encouraging. Very pastoral paragraph, I think. So differentiate a weak faith from temporary faith, from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. In Hebrews five thirteen and 14, I think he's talking about weak faith here. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So there's a levels of maturity. So we might say there's a weak faith and a strong faith. In Matthew 630, uh, Jesus called the disciples, oh, you little, of little faith. But a temporary faith would be not true faith at all. It would lack, uh, it would lack the component of, of save uh, somewhere along in the, in, in the ingredient of saving faith. It would lack something, whether it's, you know, uh, trust or commitment or, and I think that Waldron makes a point in his talking about that, that, um, if I remember correctly, that, Part of part of the, the the thing that makes saving faith saving faith is Christ is your highest commitment. Mm. Uh, your highest conviction is Christ. Where a temporary believer could believe these things, uh, just the same content, and yet they have not really uh, come to conviction that this is the 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 authority or the highest conviction in my life, or the or the highest commitment in my life the highest priority in my life. It's a different, it's a different kind of faith. It's not a lasting true faith. Yeah. I um, think of the parable of the, the soils, you know, there's the, the seed is sown. there's these, these ones that, that eagerly, you know, grab it up. But then when something comes persecution or uh, plenty comes along, it's like the, the sun comes in and dries them up because they, they sprout up quickly. But then, you know, that what they're lacking there is the, the commitment part, you know, it, going back to the, the illustration of the, the parachute, you know, they're like, yes, you know, this is what I need. I mean, if I'm on a plane and if this plane is, is going down, this is what I need. It's a parachute, you know, and, and you're, they, they grab it. They, they, be, they believe that that parachute can save their life. But then, you know, when something comes and the plane actually has an, an engine problem, and it's heading toward a mountain. Uh, they they won't they won't jump off. You know they're they're trusting in the plane, not the parachute. And of course, in the illustration, the parachute is Christ. <laughs> um, yeah. So, not to get too bogged down in or, illustrations, or, but yeah. Or if I could uh, if I if I could add to that illustration, yeah, add, add, Or if add, they put the if, or if they put the parachute on, and but their highest commitment isn't to that conviction that this is what I need. So someone on the plane starts laughing at him about the parachute. Well, you're a little sitting there. What, uh, right. 
you know, with the parachute on and look at this guy and his highest commitment isn't to Christ. So he doesn't want the flak. So he takes the parachute off. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Something, something comes along that he chooses that over and there's, there's no, there's no commitment. And, and of course we're saying the, the commitment isn't something that he conjures up him himself. I mean, true saving faith is a, is a grace of God. It's, it's given, but that's not to say that, yeah. that people won't come along and, and see the, the truth in, in certain elements. Yeah. We've defined that commitment is a part of faith and faith is a gift. Totally. The work of the God spirit through the word in our life. You do that. Fruit of regeneration. So, Although, though it, it may be many times assailed and weakened, yet it gets the, the victory. Uh, what, do you, what do you think are things that, that come along and assail and weaken faith? Persecution? I mean, that would, would that weaken your, would that be something that, that, that would weaken your faith? Your being? I think so. I think you could uh, use Martin Luther as an example. When he first was at the Diet of Worms, he the first time he was called to renounce his works and uh, renounce his his beliefs, uh, he wasn't quite sure how he's going to stand when he when he was told. You know, he had to he had to think about it, right? Was, can I think about this? Can I? I think at that moment he had weak faith, but when he went back and his faith prevailed. His faith won out. It was victorious. I think that could be an example. It cites Ephesians six sixteen, which is in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. All of the flaming arrows is anything Satan could hurl at you, whatever that's persecution or temptation to sin or whatever. And I, and I don't think that text is, is saying that that the the flaming arts darts of the devil don't have an effect on you then, because they they do. They, I mean, you feel really to use the, the words of the confession, assailed and weakened when you are attacked. You know, I know a uh, I've seen I've seen a number of, of examples where, uh, for instance, uh, there was a, a guy in our, our church that was suffering from cancer for for years, uh, kind of would go away and then would come back. And, uh, the, the one time he he had it, he had some radiation done and, and just, um, caused him severe pain. He was in, he was in tremendous pain. And then when the, the cancer came back, he was in even more pain. Um, the stuff they give him for the, the medication didn't, didn't work very well, uh, the, to control the pain. Um, he was, he had to go through chemotherapy uh, he handled that horribly. Um, he was just severely sick and, and nauseous and in pain. And it just seemed like every step of the, of the way, uh, things would just get worse uh, for him. Just over and over and over, you just see, you're like, why in the world does this guy have to have all of these these flaming darts all at once? You know, there's there's no doubt that that he had moments of, of weakness, and and questioned. You know, okay, why are why are you allowing this? Um, but it but it was it was absolutely fascinating because always he would he would come back and just talk about how he longed to be in the presence of the of the Lord and how, um, you know, he was he was willing to to suffer and. Yeah, I mean, it had a profound effect on him, but it, I mean, his his prayers were, you know, I'll never forget him because he, he just was clinging to Christ through the whole thing. And, you know, that's that's what you see. You know, he's this, this weak and frail guy, even in his weakness, clinging, clinging to, to Christ. Um, that's, that's true faith. So, you know, in the end, what got the victory... You know the the flaming darts of the of the devil that assailed him. The, you know all of those things. No, it was it was his his faith, um, or you know, 
that pointed to to Christ. So Christ was was exalted through our suffering, his suffering.